Well, good morning, church family, and our special guests this morning. We are so glad that you are here. My name is Brian Morozik. I have the privilege of serving on staff here at Crossroads, overseeing all of our next-gen ministries. Uh, so if you have a junior high, high school, or a young adult in the room, I would love for them to go join us in the landing uh, for our youth service uh, this morning. But man, we are so glad that you are here, whether this is your first time or first time in a long time. Thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, just to be a part of your weekly routine and uh, for showing up to church this morning. Uh, whether it's me or someone on our staff, we would love the opportunity to meet you, to connect with you, and to partner with you as we get you and your family connected to God and to one another. This morning we are continuing our series Jonah in part two, uh, but I just got to share something. I really believe um, that God has a word for us this morning. I really believe this is a word that we all need to hear. This is a, a moment in time that we can run to God today. And so I'm going to ask you to do something a little bit different than maybe you're used to um, or that you've ever done before. Uh, but would you join me in just holding your hands just like this uh, in, in a moment of surrender and a moment of receiving? Uh, I really believe that today if we posture ourselves before God and his word in this manner, we will receive all that he has for us. And uh, we will receive exactly who he is, who he's called us to be, and how he has called us to see people uh, that we're surrounded by. Um, so as we go into a moment of prayer, would you hold out your hands like this as we receive his word? Father, we come before you. And God, we thank you uh, for today. We thank you for how amazing you are. And Father, we are in awe of the work that you have done, the work that you are doing, and what you're going to do next in each and every one of our lives. And Father, I pray that today with our, our fists open, with our palms to heaven, that Father, we will receive the word that you have for us. And that Father, no one in this room or watching online needs to hear from me. Uh, we all need to hear from you. And Father, I pray that we will focus our hearts, our minds, and our lives upon receiving that word. And Father, not just receive it as information, but Father, receive it in order for transformation to happen in this place. So, Father, I pray that we will be transformed by hearing your word, by understanding your word, and applying your word. So, Father, I pray that you will give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. February of 1891. A British vessel called the East Star is off 500 kilometers off the coast of Argentina. Upon this, they had a massive sighting of a great sperm whale in their vicinity. And so they launched two crews into the frigid waters to go harpoon this whale. What happens next is they're searching around. Both teams are ready with spears in hand. And the whale comes to the surface. He resurfaces and one crew hits their mark. Immediately upon hitting the mark, the whale does a deep dive to 250 meters and both crews are looking around for any sign of the beast. They're waiting patiently. They're waiting also as the other crew is prepared once again to hit the mark. Yet the whale resurfaces in a way they could not even have imagined. At great speeds, the whale comes up from the water and the deep ocean and overturns one of the boats of the crew. All crew members fall into the frigid waters in the middle of the sea. And you see from the vessel, they're rescuing all of the crew, but they could not find two. After they rescue as much of the crew, they go back to the task at hand, capturing this whale. They eventually bring it to the side of the ship, and the crew members notice something different. There's movement in the belly. So they bring the whale on board, they cut him open, and their crew member, James Bartley, falls out of the belly of the whale. James survived 15 hours in the belly of a great beast. He looked different. He was blinded, yet he went on to live 18 years. In this story, some of you are going, that's made up. Some of you are going, I'm going to look into that. Some of you are just going, I believe this guy, it's true. But however you view the story, this is where we find Jonah this morning in Jonah chapter 2 in the middle of the belly of a great fish. At the end of chapter one, he's swallowed up and we find him in this moment of time having a in the belly of a whale moment. 
But before we jump into Jonah's story, can I ask you a question? Where are you at in your story? Where do you find yourself today? Do you find yourself in the belly of a whale moment? Do you find yourself heading towards rock bottom? Do you find yourself running from God in disobedience? Do you find yourself looking at life as it's spiraling out of control and there's no way to stop it? You see, what we see with Jonah in chapter one, leading into chapter two, is as you live in disobedience and you disobey who God is and who God is calling you to be, your life will take on a downward digression very quickly. You see, with Jonah, he goes down to Joppa and finds a ship, Tarshish. And you see, let me just say, anytime you're looking for an excuse to disobey God, you will always find a ship and excuse waiting. He goes down to Joppa. Then he goes down to the hole of the ship and a storm of bruise. Then he goes down once more to the belly of a fish. Ask yourself, where am I today? Am I on my way to rock bottom or am I already there? Friends, whether you are there, you find yourself on your way in this downward spiral, I believe there's hope. But for many of us, as we read Jonah chapter 2, we're going to try to comprehend, we're going to try to understand, we're, kind of, we're going to try to wrap our minds around how a man can fit in the belly of a whale. We will focus more on what's happening inside the whale. But let me encourage you and implore you this morning Instead of focusing on what's happening inside the whale, would you focus on what's happening inside of Jonah? Because I believe if we will shift our focus on what's happening in his life and his heart, we too will learn how to change. We too will be changed and transformed today. So if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open up to Jonah chapter 2 and follow along with us as we read God's word. Jonah chapter 2, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. See, the first thing we got to look at is where is Jonah? He's in the belly of what? Of a great fish. He's in the belly of a whale. So Jonah, how did you get there? How did you find yourself in this predicament, this situation, this circumstance? Well, you remember back in chapter one, it was disobedience. That God called upon Jonah. I want you to go to Nineveh and preach the message of salvation and grace and mercy. Yet Jonah, without even responding, runs the opposite direction. Remember last week, Pastor Clay shared with us, it would have been a whole lot easier for Jonah just to go the 500 miles to Nineveh than go 2,500 miles in the opposite direction. And we look at that, we're like, Jonah, come on, bro. What are you doing? But then we realize, that's what I've done too. You see, it's a lot easier to surrender and follow what God has for us instead of trying to get what we want for us. And Jonah finds himself in the belly of a great fish because of disobedience. And remember, this is a part from last week that you find Jonah, and for many of us, running. Are you running today? Are you running from God? Are you running from who God has called you to be? Are you running from the people of God in the community of God? Where do you find yourself? Because all of us are running. It just depends on what direction we are running to and what we're running from. So if disobedience is running from God, let me encourage you with this. Obedience is running to God. If disobedience is running from God, obedience is running to God. And let me be clear, all of us are running. We're all constantly moving and progressing and moving forward. So which direction have you decided? Will I go towards him? or Will I go my way away from him? And this is where you find Jonah. But I think it's important to note this. The very beginning of verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. Then Jonah prayed. And all of us look at it and go, a little late, Jonah. You're already in rock bottom. You're already in the belly of a fish. Now you want to pray? But once again, you look into the mirror and go, that's me too, right? A lot of times we pray when it's too late. We pray when we've already hit rock bottom. 
We prayed when we've exhausted all of our own self-reliance and selfishness and then to go, all right, God, now take over. Now help me out. A story I've heard recently that really depicts what this happens and how we respond in a way of prayer. You have four men in a room. Three of them are ministers and one of them is a telephone repairman. And the first minister begins the conversation with the other two ministers about the most powerful positions of prayer. And the first one says, I really believe the most powerful way you can pray is to lift your hands to God. The second minister goes, no, you've got it all wrong. The best way to pray, the most powerful way to pray is get on your knees, go before the feet of Jesus. And the third minister once again goes, guys, both of you are wrong. The best way to pray is in prostrate. Put your face to the ground and sacrifice it all. Then the telephone repairman in the back of the room goes, hey, uh, sorry, I've been listening. I've been eavesdropping a little bit. But guys, you know, the most powerful prayer I've ever prayed is dangling 40 feet from a telephone line. (laughs) But isn't that most of us? When life hits hard, that's when we pray. We lose sight to God's blessings because we're so focused on doing it our way and living our life. But what if instead of then we prayed, now we pray? We pray through it all. We focus our hearts upon him and live in obedience. If disobedience is running from God, obedience is running to God. Obedience is saying, I'm no longer going to run. I'm going to focus on your way, not my way. I'm going to listen. I'm going to understand. I'm going to comprehend who you are and who you've called me to be and how you've called me to love those around me that I'm going to live in obedience. So Jonah prays. And you see, it's really easy for us to look at situations in our life and get angry where God has us at certain moments of time. But realize God did not send the whale to kill Jonah. He sent the whale to save Jonah. He sent the whale to stop Jonah in his disobedience. So who or what has God set in your life to stop your disobedience, to set you on a path of obedience? See, Jonah's story continues. It says this, Jonah chapter two, verse three, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. You see, when you first read this, it sounds like anger. It sounds like many of us. I can't believe you would do this. Why not do that to them? Why would you do that to them? They're they're so far away from you. They're, They're living in disobedience, but then you have to look at your own life. How am I going to respond to the places and situations God has placed me in? And is my place and situation determined by my disobedience or my obedience? And even if you're in that place because of your disobedience, how can I change this and see this for why God has done this. So you find Jonah in this moment, he's praying, he's crying out to the Lord. And first, let me say, in verse three, he's describing the storm. He's describing the waves, the chaos. And let me just say this this morning, friends and family, sometimes God will bring a storm and situation in our life to break us of our self-reliance to break us of our selfishness, to break us so we surrender in obedience to him. But you see, you have this moment in verse four, then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. There's a powerful statement that I want us to all focus on this morning. Again, I will look upon your temple. This word again means to return, to turn back, to turn from our evil ways and turn what is good, holy, and righteous. Jonah is beginning to have a posture of grace through surrender. Yet I shall look upon your holy temple. I will refocus my life and my eyes upon who you are, not what I want to be. Will we today once again turn our eyes to the creator? Will we turn back to the savior of the world? Would we focus our hearts and our minds once again on the one who loves us, cares for us, and has something in store for us? See, obedience 
is a sign of following God, but also obedience is the beginning of repentance. Today, this is what we're talking about. I believe this is the message we need to receive from God, that it's time to repent, to confess, to own it, and to turn back to him, to follow after him. Just stop fighting him because church, family, friends, we can fight him really good, but we will never win because he's stronger, powerful, and greater than we could ever possibly imagine. So let's stop fighting God and start following God. And family, I really believe the way we do that is by returning, by repenting in obedience to him. So the beginning of obedience is repentance. And let me be clear, repentance is not saying I'm sorry. It's showing action that I will right the wrongs that I've done. Many of us say I'm sorry. But have we actually changed? Many of us like to say the information, but how are we actually being transformed? You see, you know someone's heart by the transformation, not the information that they're speaking into you. You see, family, this is it. The beginning of obedience is repentance. So what does it mean to repent? It means to rearrange your thinking, your feeling, your being, who you are, forsake all that which is wrong and focus on what is right, what is holy, what is righteous. And if you focus on the words of Jonah, he's not angry, he's repentant. He's not just remorseful and saying, I'm sorry, he's going, God, I'm ready to change. God, I'm ready to see it in a different light. God, I'm ready to follow after you instead of fighting you. So as we continue to read this morning, would you focus not just on the information, but on the transformation that the word of God can play in your life today, in the life of your family, your friends, your business, your coworkers. Transformation is the heart of God. Repentance is where it begins. So in Jonah, you continue in his story in verse 5. It says, The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you. Isn't that a beautiful statement? Yet you. When all of life is chaotic, when all my situations and circumstances are out of control, yet you, God, are still good. Yet you, God, still have a purpose. Yet you, God, are still working even when I can't see it. Yet you brought up my life from the pit. He begins to rejoice. Oh, Lord, my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. How quick it is for us to forget who God is. How easy is it for us to forget all that he has done, all that he is doing, and what he's promised he's going to do next. And when you forget who God is, you become blinded to the blessings he has right in front of you. So I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you and to your holy temple. Let me look again at your holy temple. Let me remember your holy temple. You see, the beginning of obedience is repentance. And if disobedience is running from God, then obedience is running to God. And repentance requires change. And what I want to tell you this morning is I believe Jonah lays it out perfectly how we can change in a heart and posture of repentance. Here's the first one. Repentance requires a change of perspective. A change of perspective. Remember what he says, let me remember the Lord. Would you take a moment and remember all that God has done for you? How he's shown up in your life. How he's protected you how he's even provided for you, even if it wasn't by your preference, how he stopped you in your disobedience to set you on a new path of obedience. You see, when you look at the life of Jonah, we can look at it and go, man, I can't believe God would send a fish. But Jonah's going, God, thank you for sending a fish. Thank you for providing three days and three nights for me to get my heart right so you can launch me back out into the world to live a mission for you. God, thank you for providing me in the most unlikely way possible. In church, family, friends, I believe God provides all the time. 
He provided for the Israelites. He provides for us. We just sang about it. He's the same God yesterday as he is today and forever. God provides. So would you change your perspective? Because that's what Jonah does. He remembers, he celebrates. And church, let me encourage you. Prayer, the goal of prayer is not to change your mind, it's to change your life. It's not to change your mind, it's to change your life. Will I realign my purposes and plans with his purposes and plans? Would I realign my desires with what he desires? Would I realign my will for his will and his will alone? Not my will be done, but your will be done, Father, on earth as it is in heaven. See, Jesus modeled that in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's your will, take this from me. Father, if it's your will, please help me. Father, if it's your will, would I just recognize that this is your plan? the savior of the world, our Lord and savior, Jesus Christ, the model, the exemplary for how we are called to live and how we are called to be and interact. If he prayed that prayer, not my will, but yours be done, shouldn't we be humbled enough to surrender and pray that prayer as well? See, obedience requires repentance and repentance requires a change of perspective. And then in verse eight, Jonah says this, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voices of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. What a powerful statement from a guy in a fish. Rock bottom, nowhere to turn, no way he can help himself, yet he has a change of perspective. And before we get to the second part of what repentance requires, let me share with you what he says. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Turn away from them. Stop running to the promises of what the world says and run to the open arm and the promises of the Father and Almighty God in heaven. We've got to run to him. Yet church, I know we're good at running. I'm good at running. This verse right here depicts a moment in my life. When I graduated high school, I immediately moved to Los Angeles, California with one of my best friends. We had the world promised to us in the career of being musicians. We had record labels on the desk. We were meetings left and right. Yet after three weeks, I was rock bottom. I was focusing on the vain idols of the world when I should forsake them and return to the hope and the love of Jesus. And it was in that moment of hitting rock bottom, broke, nowhere to turn, angry. God, I thought you gave me these gifts and these passions to go live them out and make a a light in the darkness. What happened? But it was my aunt that was finishing up Bible college. I said, Brian, you've been living in disobedience. It's time to live a life of obedience. You know what she encouraged me to to read? Jonah. This is my life and this is many of our lives. We're really good at running. But should we run away or to? It's a whole lot better to run to God instead of from God. So Jonah encourages us, get rid of those things. Stop running to the empty promises and run to the fulfillment of the promises in Jesus And he says in verse nine, but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Repentance requires a change of perspective, but number two, it requires a change of posture. A change of posture. Since verse seven, Jonah's spiritual eyes have been opening He changes from sorrow to thanksgiving. He changes from selfishness to sacrifice. The true sign of repentance, church and family, is humility and surrender. We've got to stop living a life of a closed-fisted mentality and open our hands up to receive all that God has for us. And for many of us, me included, I like control. 
I like to focus my situations. I like to control my circumstances. I like to control the people around me, but God is going, no, I'm in control. Would you let me control? Do you trust me to control? And it's a posture that makes the difference. It's a posture that opens us up to really focusing on that we cannot save ourselves for salvation belongs to who? The Lord. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And a true sign of repentance is humility and surrender. Surrendering because we realize we cannot save ourselves and trust the one who can. For he saves and only he saves. See, Jonah's life continues, but it has this moment in verse 10 where we're going to end today. It says, and the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Gross. I don't know if I'd prefer to be in the belly of the fish or in the vomit of the fish. But listen, this happened because of his change of heart. His change of spirit, his change of perspective, his change of posture, and that repentance leads to and requires a change of position. For Jonah, physically, his position changed, right? He was no longer in captive to the belly of a fish. He was vomited out upon dry land. But instead of focusing just on his physical position, what do you focus on his spiritual position? He had a change of heart. He had a change in his spirit. He repositioned himself in surrender and obedience to the Lord our God. In prayer, this is what prayer does. It doesn't always change your circumstance, but it will always change you. It doesn't always change your circumstance, but it will always change you. Always change us. So family and friends, will we position ourselves in surrender and obedience to God? Will we sacrifice our wants and our needs and surrender to what he wants and will give to us? See, there's absolutely nothing that we can do about our situation from slave to sin, from free to sin, outside of the name of Jesus. And if you want to change a position, that is the change you've been looking for. That under sin and the law, you are a slave to sin. Yet by the name of Jesus, you are free from sin. That you have a purpose, God has a plan for you, that we are in need as rebellious people, a savior, and I know one. His name is Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and it's time that we stop hiding from him and we find ourselves hiding in him. And you see, the beauty is just like with Jonah, God gives us a second chance. But the beauty is not just a second chance, another chance. His grace and his mercy is sufficient. It is abounding. It is constant. So what can we do? How can we respond to a story like this that we won't just ingest information, but we will have transformation? and change, repent, and surrender. What will it take, family and friends, in our lives so that we change and once again turn our eyes back to his holy temple, to who he is? See, an amazing part about Jonah chapter two that I find really interesting is that all he's doing is quoting scripture. As a Jewish young man, he would have had the Psalms in his hands to memorize, to understand, to comprehend the goodness and the grace of mercy of God. And all that you see in Jonah chapter 2 is simply Jonah without words, yet he's quoting the psalmist. For salvation belongs to the Lord. For let me once again look at your holy temple. Let me return back to you. And you see, we look at the Psalms, and there's a major character who is a writer, King David. Whether you grew up in church for a while or this is your first time here, most likely you've heard of David be referred to as the man after God's own heart. Isn't that something we all want to be known for? 
But what I find interesting is how can a man like David be known for that? Because do you remember what David did? David had an affair. He became an adulterer with a woman named Bathsheba. And because he wanted to hide it from God and hide it from his people and hide it from his power, he had her husband murdered. Yet we remember this man as a man after God's own heart. How can that be? See, I want to share with you Psalm chapter 32. David writes this psalm and listen to what he says very closely in the first five verses. Blessed is the one whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. In his own spirit, there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Listen very closely to this next verse. I acknowledge my sin to you. I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity from you. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. After all David did, how can he be remembered as a man after God's own heart? It is right here, family and friends, because he had a heart of repentance, a heart of change, a heart of humility, a heart of surrender, a heart of confession, a heart to return back to the Father in heaven. Will we have a heart to return back to him? Will we have a posture of humility and surrender? Will we change our perspective and focus on what is good, holy, and righteous? And will we position ourselves on the authority of his word and the authority of who he is so we can become who he's called us to be? Church, what will it take? What will it take for us to change? What will it take that our transformation is in align with the information we've received and the word of God that is in front of us? Will it take a belly and a fish moment? Will it take the death of a loved one? Will it take great consequence? Will it take hitting rock bottom and not knowing how to save ourselves, church, family, and friends? It doesn't have to be this way, for we can repent today. Will we repent today? Will we change our perspective? Will we change our posture? And will we change our position? If you're in this room and you've recognized this morning that you have been running away from God and you want to change from disobedience to obedience today in this moment of decision, you can run towards him. You can run towards him. And he does not approach you with a heavy fist or a heavy heart, but with open arms, with grace and mercy. It is abounding. You have been forgiven. Will you own it? Will you confess it? Will you repent from it? And watch how God will change and transform your life. Maybe you're in the room today and you've realized that your life is in a downward digression, a downward out of control spiral. And it's time that it stops and it's time that you step in obedience to the life that God has for you. Come forward. We wanna pray with you. We wanna partner with you as you follow after God. Church, today is a day of salvation. Today is an opportunity to repent, to change, and to be changed so that we launch from this place, this building, and go change the world around us with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let us not just hear the information this morning, but let us be transformed and changed by the heart of Jesus, that he has come to save, to find all that is lost. And he offers that salvation to each and every one of us today. It doesn't matter how far or how long you've been running. Today, you can run home.